Session 3 of Scripture 101. Did it really happen? History and the Bible. As biblical scholars examine these sacred texts, more questions about what really happened arise. Did the events happen the way they are reported in the Bible? Did they happen at all? How a person answers the question will affect the way he or she reads every single page of the Bible. We should start with a consideration of actual history. This is what we're familiar with. It verifies the details, the supporting proof, we could take the Kennedy assassination as an example. We have evidence who was in the car, where the killing shot came from, where Vice President Johnson was at the time. There are certainly questions about the grassy knoll, but as a historical event, it is documented. But professional historians are the first to point out that history is an interpretation, a reconstruction of events based upon the data at hand. We are looking at what we might call confessed history, the purpose of remembered history is not to archive the past, but to reveal the meaning behind the event. Behind any story, there is an event. Something happened. Just what is it? And that, of course, would be what we're pursuing. Historical criticism is an approach to scripture. It will use archaeology. It will examine other written sources. And in some ways can approach the event behind the story. As we take a look at the following example. The story of Noah and the flood. What really happened? Many people will ask, what about the ancient accounts of a flood, such as the Epic of Gilgamesh? They say that these different accounts prove that the Bible plagiarized earlier stories. I am sometimes amused at this assertion, as the person saying them often doesn't realize that this is a case in favor of the Bible being true. And it is true that the Epic of Gilgamesh and others are very similar to the biblical account. In fact, there are quite a few more that I would like to add to the list before we get started. Legends have surfaced in hundreds of cultures throughout the world that tell of a huge, catastrophic flood that destroyed most of mankind, and that was survived only by a few individuals and animals. Although most historians who have studied this matter estimate that these legends number in the 200s, according to evolutionary geologist Robert Sosh, quote, Noah is but one tale in a worldwide collection of at least 500 flood myths which are the most widespread of all ancient myths and therefore can be considered among the oldest. Sash went on to observe, Narratives of a mass inundation are found all over the world. Stories of a great deluge are found on every inhabited continent and among a great many different language and culture groups. Over a century ago, the famous Canadian geologist Sir William Dawson wrote about how the record of the flood, quote, is preserved in some of the oldest historical documents of several distinct races of men and is indirectly corroborated by the whole tenor of the early history of most of the civilized races. Legends have been reported from nations such as China, Babylon, Mexico, Egypt, Sudan, Syria, Persia, India, Norway, Wales, Ireland, Indonesia, Romania, etc., composing a list that could go on for many pages. Although the vast number of such legends is surprising, the similarity between much of their content is equally amazing. James Perloff noted, in 95% of the more than 200 flood legends, the flood was worldwide. In 88%, a certain family was favored. 
In 70%, survival was by means of a boat. In 67%, animals were also saved. In 66%, the flood was due to the wickedness of man. In 66%, the survivors had been forewarned. In 57%, they ended up on a mountain. And in 35%, birds were sent out from the boat. And in 9%, exactly 8 people were spared. What is the significance of the various flood legends? We have well over 200 flood legends, and possibly more than 500. Many of the legends come from different ages and civilizations that could not possibly have copied any of the similar legends. The legends were recorded long before any missionaries arrived to relate them to the Genesis account of Noah, and almost all civilizations have some sort of flood legend. The conclusion to be drawn from such facts is that in the distant past, there was a colossal flood that forever affected the history of all civilizations. Those living after the flood did not have the book of Genesis to read to their descendants. Genesis was not written until several hundred years after the flood. The account of the flood was passed on from one generation to the next. Many parents and grandparents told their children and grandchildren about the huge ark, the animals, the devastating flood, long before the Genesis record ever existed. Alfred Raywinkle wrote, Traditions similar to this record are found among nearly all the nations and tribes of the human race, and this is as one would expect it to be. If that awful world catastrophe, as described in the Bible, actually happened, the existence of the flood traditions among the widely separated and primitive people is just what is to be expected. After the cultural trappings are stripped away from the kernel of truth in the various stories, there is almost complete agreement among practically all flood accounts. A. A universal destruction by water of the human race and all other living things occurred. B. An ark or boat was provided as the means of escape for some. And C. A seed of mankind was provided to perpetuate humanity. As Foreman Curley once observed, these traditions agree in too many vital points not to have originated from the same factual event. In Volume 3 of his multi-volume set, The Native Races of the Pacific Slope, H. H. Bancroft wrote, There never was a myth without meaning. There is not one of these stories, no matter how silly or absurd, which was not founded on fact. So on the first point, this assertion that the ancient flood stories somehow challenged the biblical account is backwards. Ancient accounts of the flood are exactly what you would expect to find if the flood actually occurred. As are the various differences in the minor details that are observed. This too is what one would expect, like a game of telephone. The question then becomes, is the Genesis account more reliable, and if so, why? On the second point, I would like to address the issue of borrowing, since some claim that the accounts can be demonstrated to be written down before the book of Genesis, and that there is a chance that the writer of Genesis could have known about the Epic of Gilgamesh or another account and simply plagiarized it. Now, what is interesting about this assertion of dependence is that it is never asserted to be a literary dependence. All scholars agree that the differences in detail and content between Genesis and the Mesopotamian precursors are detrimental against it. Even scholars that do think the Hebrew accounts were dependent on the earlier Mesopotamian accounts are quick to point out that it is not literary dependence. Listen to these authors and remember that they are trying to prove that there is borrowing, but know that they cannot from a scholarly, literary perspective assert it. Quote, the derivative nature of the biblical flood narrative, or rather the existence of an antecedent Mesopotamian tradition from the earlier forms of the biblical story is undeniable. However, the extent to which the latter narrative is derived from the earlier tradition remains uncertain. A direct form of literary influence cannot be asserted, as the distinctive features of the representative narratives are too plentiful to allow such an affirmation. All one can say is that the biblical accounts must have been influenced by the Mesopotamian oral tradition or by a pre-existing series of such orally transmitted traditions. I would assert here that this is exactly what you would expect if such a flood really did happen. Another author asserts, however, it has yet to be shown that there was borrowing even indirectly. Differences between the Babylonian and the Hebrew traditions can be found in factual details of the flood narrative, from the ark, the duration of the flood, the identity of the birds and their dispatch, and are most obvious in the ethical and religious concepts of the whole of each composition. 
All who suspect or suggest borrowing by the Hebrews are compelled to admit large-scale revision, alteration, and reinterpretation in a fashion that cannot be substantiated for any other composition from the ancient Near East or in any, any other Hebrew writings. If there was borrowing, then it can have been extended only as far as the, quote, historical framework, and not included intention or interpretation. And another author states, It is obvious the differences are too great to encourage a belief in direct connection between Atrahasis and Genesis, but just as obviously there is some kind of involvement in the historical traditions generally of the two peoples. So basically, from a scholarly, literary perspective, there was no borrowing that can be demonstrated, and even the skeptics know this. For a very extensive scientific examination on the details of this assertion, please click on the description section of this video, where I will link some relevant information. Now to the final point, which is, if there are many accounts of this event from all over the world, why should we consider the one in Genesis to be more reliable from a historical perspective? And while there is a debate on which ones came first, we will assume for the sake of argument that the Mesopotamian accounts were first. The Epic of Gilgamesh and the Biblical account of Noah's Flood have a lot of similarities. This is no surprise, since they are both retelling the same event in history, most likely, a worldwide flood. But like thousands of flood legends around the world, the Gilgamesh story seems to have suffered from poor record keeping. See if you can tell what's wrong. Let's take a look at each vessel. Here they are, drawn to scale, using the same cubit length of 0.5 meters. There is a good chance that the Gilgamesh storyteller got his icons confused. Rumor has it that a certain tower in Babylon was built on a square base. Yet some modern scholars want you to think that the Noah story grew out of the Babylonian mess-ups like this. The breadth to depth ratio is famous, of course. Everyone knows that 1.67 BD works very well and is quite normal for a cargo ship. This is an important factor for roll stability, but also has a bearing on the sea keeping. Increasing the width will provide even more stability, but at a cost. Roll accelerations can increase to uncomfortable and even dangerous levels. The length to depth ratio dominates the strength properties of the hull. Too long and shallow and the ship might break in half, due to the bending applied by the waves. The KRISO-based study indicated that 30 centimeter or 12 inches timber hull on a 40 centimeter structure would be sufficient for waves up to 30 meters high, which is a significant wave height. Noah's Ark has a very good proportion for a ship. Naval architects at the world-class KRISO facility conducted a study on Noah's Ark and found the vessel's proportions to be nearly optimal. The 6 to 1 length to breadth ratio is a little wider than the today's vessels designed to move forward quickly, but it provides increased stability for a drifting vessel. A longer vessel has disadvantages for stability. After having viewed the video, what can we say? What does historical criticism help us to establish? There was a flood that the evidence suggests was likely worldwide. Further, the Bible reports a detail of design that is accurate, beyond what we would have expected from the time in which the flood occurred. What else? What happened to the Ark? The History Channel produced a program in search of Noah's Ark with the contention that it is located on Mount Ararat, although no one can get to it. Does it matter if we find it? It certainly would be interesting would that prove that Noah was the captain and the other details are correct? Since we are not dealing with history as we know it, but a confessed history, we can say that God was behind what happened and established a covenant with us.
and that the flood was a foreshadowing of what else God had in store for us.